issued by the governor of the state of California. There will not be a public location for participating in this meeting. Any interested member of the public can participate telephonically or via internet by utilizing the web link or dial-in information printed on this agenda. Instructions on how to make a public comment during the meeting. At points in the meeting, when the meeting chair requests public comment, members of the public participating in the live meeting, either via internet or telephone, shall indicate their desire to speak. If participating via internet, please click the raise hand feature located within the Zoom application screen. If connected via telephone, please dial star nine. Thank you. All right, our first item is uh, adoption of the agenda as presented. Uh, any comment or changes by any of the commissioners? If hearing none, uh, we'll adopt the agenda as presented. Uh, item number two is public comment on night agenda items. Do we have any members of the public with us tonight? Yeah, one second, John. Okay. Oh, hold on, hold on. All right, sorry. Stephen, yes. Good evening, yes. Stephen. Yes. Hey, thank you. Any other public comment? Okay, we'll move on to uh, item number three. This is uh, draft minutes of our April 27th, 2021 PNR Commission meeting. We're looking to approve these minutes. Uh, any questions or comments from commissioners? Hearing none, I assume all is good. I guess I would then ask for a, a motion to approve. A motion to approve. And a second. Second. 
So a uh, motion by Campos, second by uh, Chasm. Uh, all in favor? You need to ask for public comment first, John. So. Oh, public comment, excuse me, pardon me. Stephen, any comments on our uh, <coughs> you have You have no public comment on the minutes. Okay, then we will uh, call for a vote. All in favor? Okay, uh, motion passes unanimously. Uh, next item, item number four, draft minutes of the May 11th, 2021 board meeting. This is something for our review. Any comments from the commissioners uh, regarding the uh, board meeting? The uh, John, if you don't mind, the one thing, as Stephen pointed out earlier, obviously the big item, two big items from this meeting was uh, the annual operating budget for 2021-2022 was uh, adopted. And then obviously the uh, board moved in favor of the park maintenance facility, as well as taking on one of the ad alt items, which was uh, the installation of uh, cabinets and a bathroom sink in the break area. Um, certainly happy to answer any questions regarding that uh, within the scope here. It was a uh, uh, a much discussed item. Um, personally, I was happy to see the board move forward with it. I, I think it was a long overdue project. Uh, several commissioners chimed in on it. So uh, thank you guys for uh, participating as well. Yeah, I'm um, curious about the adults. Um, I know there was the, the cabinets, there was the fencing. Um, you just what was that dis discussion decision process like to adopt the cabinets? Uh, well, that one was pretty easy. The cost that came in on it was very reasonable. They all came in at the same. I, all of the so the three adults was the fencing. The second was the cabinets, um, and then the third was uh, what's known as kind of vertical security slash shade fins that are to go uh, into the windows in the conditioned area. Um, and it was determined that all, all, all three um, could uh, to some degree be handled by force account labor, i.e. Uh, our staff in-house. Um, the pricing on the cabinets and the sink was very competitive to what we would have wound up doing it for anyway. So they accepted that. Um, the pricing on the courtyards was very expensive. And one of the things that, you know, we did a lot of research after those came in, uh, and kind of looking at that, and it's certainly a project um, from a temporary standpoint, most likely that our staff can handle, especially on the Western side, which also kind of produces a bit of a security fencing around, not only usable space, but uh, helps to enclose what is otherwise an open-ended portion of the uh, facility. Uh, but and just re-looking at it more from kind of a landscape perspective, as opposed to a, a, a construction build perspective, and if uh, depending on how our guys wind up doing it and they won't start working on it until it's totally completed, uh, you know, we might, we, we'll have them put up something and then we'll be able to reevaluate. And if in a year or two after completion, we want to redesign and re-put that out to bid, we can. Um, the, you know, the silver lining is it does actually give us a good opportunity to, you know, kind of examine uh, our flow in and out of the building and the facility uh, and then kind of redesign the courtyards if needed. Uh, ultimately, they're also part of the aesthetic of the building that goes in there. So I think it's important to get that right and get it done. Uh, my mantra on this from day one has been we only get one shot to do it right. Um, but in this case, uh, the expense was quite a bit additional to the already the base bid. So uh, we're gonna have staff work on that. Uh, once all construction is done, they can put that piece together. And if needed a couple of years down the line, we can and will revisit it at that time. When you said, um, so it sounds like the, the structure will be built, the add-on fencing will be done at a later date, but something in the interim, what does that something look like? I don't have a total sketch out of it. It'll be something that our staff can build. You know, it'll be most likely some sort of a chain link or a wood type fence. Uh, and we want it to come in and look nice. Obviously, our staff has built a lot of fencing. It was just part of the project that we really wanted to have it come in and not put that on them. But at the, uh, the cost that came in with all of the bids for this part of it was just very high. And in talking to the architect, 
talking to the park staff, um, we definitely think we can redesign and respect that to some degree and get those costs down significantly and still have a very usable 50 year uh, fencing around the courtyard once that part's done. But so, so it sounds like some type of maybe chain link, something fairly easy, not too labor intensive, but probably, you know, eight feet high, six feet high, something like that with a some kind of slot like visual barrier type of thing. Is that what you're thinking? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, and as we uh, get closer to that, like I said, it's not gonna be something we're gonna even touch until all of the construction of the building yeah, right. itself is done. Get those guys out of the way. We don't wanna be getting in the way of their work by any stretch. Um, and then our guys will come in. But once we get closer to that point, you know, we'll certainly revisit and look at the material. It might be chain link. It could be, you know, a wood. It could be a combo. It could be, you know, so I don't want to pin us into a very specific design at this point because in reality, we're eight, nine months away from that. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to get some sense. And in the it'll definitely on the, I'm sorry, John, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, I, it'll definitely be something on the west side at a minimum. Because again, that also presents a level of security to the whole facility. Because if you remember the kind of open air uh, um, kind of garage portion of this is open on the, on the westernmost side. So it, we, you know, it needs something that can kind of close that whole area off. And the, the, the other, duration would be unknown for when that we would get the interim to the kind of more final fencing. We have no idea. Like, is there a ballpark a, on that? Not at this time. I would be hesitant to uh, kind of put something out there and quote it. I think it just depends on it'll be a wait and see. And, you know, what our guys might do might wind up being more permanent than we're giving them credit for. And like, so too. So I just I want to see how it comes out um, and then decide, uh, you know, what our true needs are and then go from there. John, Any anything other? else from you? Oh, no, that was that was a thank you. Okay, and I guess I would just weigh in on that. And um, Eric, I agree with you. We want to do something that's going to complement the structure. It would be a shame to build a really beautiful building and then put a chain link chain link fence around it. I'd be sad to see that, right? So. Yeah, no, we'll make sure it looks nice. One of the things we've also been talking about is along the back wall, because we do own those large storage units that are currently being used in the temporary area, and the back wall of that could potentially be kind of the back, and then the fence works way from that out to the south and then back to the east to the building. And I think we all recognize that this is going to be a nice building. Aesthetics were part of it, just given the environment where it's going. Um, so we, we are going to want something that looks nice and not something that is just, you know, kind of your standard chain link fence. Um, and also to John's point, it would need to have, you know, some levels of covering, uh, you know, visual barrier in it too. So it's not just an open metal fence. Um, but all of that is certainly being taken into account. And as we get closer to that point, we can certainly kind of revisit what some of our thoughts and ideas are on it uh, as we kind of get a better sense of what's going on there and our timing. Yeah, I think your idea of uh, re-engaging maybe the design process as you think through what you could do in-house versus what could be done to sort of value engineer something that is aesthetically great and then put that out, you know, and see what you get back from a bid perspective. That might be a good way to do it because it is yeah. going to be a beautiful building and it does make a difference because it's the main walking path and it's the experience of that area and everything. So, you know, yeah. it just would be... A bummer to see that lost. Agreed. Ian, anything you want to add to that? Okay, then I'll ask for any public comment. One sec, please.
Thank you. Uh, there's nothing else on the board meeting. We'll move on to item number five. Uh, this is the Marinwood Park Place Structures Replacement Project. This is uh, for discussion. Yeah, if I, could just, if I could lead into this for one second, John, if you don't mind, uh, we'll have two different parts of this discussion tonight. One uh, was included, Commissioner Fine, uh, you know, helped draft just kind of a, a preliminary uh, survey that we can put out to the community looking for some feedback. And then uh, Commissioner Shawsom has also done some research on, uh, you know, you know, various kind of playground components uh, costing started you know actually communicating with some of the vendors so it probably easiest we kind of take those in order I think so kind of whichever way you would like to go with that John just uh, let us know and we'll move in that direction no I, I think that makes sense to me so, so first we'll uh, talk about the survey sure sure so the it's, this is included in the packet. Um, this exists on a on SurveyMonkey, um, uh, which I understand the district has a, an account for. So we'll be able to um, push that out. And this would, you know, right in, in the packet, it's just the text of what would be separate questions in the or a little introduction, introductory paragraphs, and then some separate questions. Um, and um, the as of now, there's like four. Um, these were ones that were generally recommended by, as I mentioned last month, Al, who uh, had previously worked with the district and had done some community engagement on the playground replacement at Albert Park. And so these were sort of things that she suggested would be worthwhile to include in a survey. Um, these are very rough um, and would invite any and all comments um, on the rank your favorite existing features, I'll say that I did this just sort of back of my hand and I may have mischaracterized uh, what features are actually called. And it may be that there are important features in our play structures that are not included on here. Um, so, and I tried to reach out to Luke, but wasn't able to connect with him before this got surveyed. So um, if folks have other things to add to that one in particular, um, that would be good. One, one other, sorry for the background noise. One other th thought I had was like whether to um, include a question of like, are you a Marinwood resident or not? But that felt um, a little bit um, unnecessary. Um, I think, um, you know, we'll probably, I'm imagining we would send this out, a link out to Marinwood residents and have a link, um, a, a flyer up at the playground itself but given that our playground is used by people beyond Marinwood, um, it felt like potentially, I don't know, unnecessary and exclusionary to ask that question. So I left that out for now. Sorry for the background noise. Ian, I, I just jump in. I, I think the survey looks good. I, I, and I agree with you. I think, um, it, you know, there's a national conversation happening on equity, and I, I don't think it would be good to include uh, the question about being a resident because it's a it's a public playground. So, I, but I, I like it. I like the way you know you kind of listed the features, um, the structures, and and getting kind of a sense of ranking. It makes sense to me. I mean, I I'm, not, I'm certainly no expert in putting these surveys out, but. It was like sometimes I always think whenever we put out any kind of public notice, I'm always striving for fewer words, the better, because if there's too many words, people 
sometimes may not read it at all. Um, but this seems this seems pretty pretty good, pretty spot on. So, um, Ian, I think this is. I agree. I think this is a really good survey. Um, I guess one one thing that I'm wondering is. Um, well, you know, a, you know, where are we finding the population to send this to? And then two, um, the data that we're going to collect from this. I mean, how, how do we have a thought of like how we're going to compile it? Because it, it looks like three of the four questions are kind of free form. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, just when we're, you know, is there going to be a way to sort of quantify that when we're looking at the data? Yeah. Um... So I would imagine, although I think we could, you know, this is, it's a good, the first, I'll take the first question of where we would send this out. I think, I think Eric had pitched some ideas, which sounded right to me. We could do, are we, I don't know if we have like a sending to Marinwood prop, you know, residents or whatever, whatever uh, emails we might have for that. There's also the active, what is it? Active.net, people that have registered for any of our recreation activities on there. Those would be the sort of two things that would jump in the mind. I, I've seen Eric post things on like next door before. So you could like post a link to the survey there. Um, and then I was imagining like flat, like maybe two flyers at either entrance to the playground that's um, that we could post that would have, uh, maybe someone else mentioned this, but there could be like a web link or in a QR code you could even do, or is that what those things are called? Where somebody could like use their cell phone and then it would take them to the survey. Um, and so that was my, those are the sort of, I don't know what I didn't count, but that sounds like four possible places we could send it out or ways we could get people to fill in, fill it out. Um, I think the first question would be pretty easily quantifiable. Like we'll just get, you know, through survey monkey, it'll tabulate the, the rankings. Um, and I think what Ashley suggested about that one was just, it'll give you a good, baseline for when you're looking at potential new models of like, wow, the swings are like a no brainer. We need to have those or, you know, things like that, that there are certain things that you just realize are sort of like a must um, and other things that are less important. So that was why she suggested that. Um, the other ones I think aren't going to be as easy to quantify. I, I, I said, I don't know how, how many space, I don't know how many people are actually going to fill this out. My guess is it's not going to be as important as this project is. My guess is this, it's not going to be a humongous number. Um, and so I think, I don't know, I'd be happy to volunteer to sort of go through them and, and tabulate, um, you know, at least for the second question of like favorite playgrounds. I think we could, my guess is there's going to be like a handful of ones that recur a lot. Um, and so we can, you know, it's not going to be a scientific exercise, but I think that'll at least give us some direction of like things that seem popular. Um, so anyway, I don't know if that completely answers that, but um, I'm, I'm happy to volunteer to work with staff or do a lot of it on my own to sort of like come up with a analysis of the results. Um, I, he I hear you that it might be easier if some of those two, three, and four were more sort of quantifiable as opposed to less. I thought about on the favorite playgrounds in Marin County, I thought about like listing a few. I mean, we could do that. Maybe we could come up with, but I also worried that that would be like maybe a bias of like pushing people toward the ones that we think to list. But but if if I could see us doing that, if we came up with 10 playgrounds and listed them and then did other and left that, that might make it easier to quantify the answers to that one. Um, so those are my initial thoughts, but I don't know if Eric or anyone else had other thoughts as to either pieces of your questions. Thanks, Ian. So I, got, I have a couple things. Um, just uh, jump in first on the, the, what is your favorite playground? It's a great question. Um, I wonder if we could put in the Bay Area, just because Marin County is pretty small in terms of the variety of playgrounds. So I know that would open that up even a little bit more, but it might be interesting to see what we get back, right? And um, because folks may have comments on other things. Um, so that's just just one thought. It does kind of complicate the results a little bit more. Um, and just little stuff on here. So you might want to add sandbox to favorite features uh, would be a big one. Um, and then I don't know how you say this, but it's like, it's just the, 
like the platforms on the play structure, like the little guys, the toddlers like to like go up the stairs and go down the little toddler slides. I'm not sure how we say that, but it's something like that. Um, just the climbing platform. The other thing to consider is we might want to put on here where we say it's, you know, reaching the end of their useful life. I might, I might just say expected life. Um, or maybe just work with that language a little bit. And then you might want to put in here like the year in which we're thinking about doing this project, just because people have just been through a lot with the pandemic. It's really interesting as I talk about this playground project, a lot of people, they just go, oh, really? You're going to, like, it's not an overwhelmingly positive response that we're going to remodel the playground. So I think if you put it out there that it's going to be a little bit later, then folks can kind of start to get excited about it. It's just people have had so much change in the last year that it's, it's just change is hard right now. So if you tell them it's going to be, I think it's like two or three years out that we're actually going to do the construction, then it, it just might make this a, a more fun process for the community, knowing that there's a long runway on it. So that would just be my like my couple of comments, but it's a great survey. I really liked it when I read it. It's, it's fantastic. I like all those suggestions. I do think changing the favorite category to the Bay Area would make it harder to like give a menu of things to, you know, to, for people to click. So that would, if I like the idea of doing that one instead, um, but that would, that would probably push me to leaving that one as an open-ended comment box. Um, and I liked all your other suggestions. Yeah, uh, Luke can speak to this probably better than I can because him and his team have probably used it more than I have recently. But you know, in terms of Survey Monkey, I mean, you're exactly right, Ian, in that when you have a, a quantitative question, like you know, a ranking question, it it breaks those out and you know, it kind of gives you shows you charts and however you want to look at it. Um, in terms of the qualitative questions, you know, these kind of open-ended, they definitely uh, also compile, you know, kind of those responses for you. So you can see them all usually within the, the scope of, you know, any reports that you run as the survey administrator. So it generally kind of comes through pretty clean. Um, in talking about that second question, I mean, I just kind of jotted down instead of in Marin County, it could be just something like, you know, what is your favorite local playground or what is your favorite playground in the general area? Um, something along those lines that uh, nothing else could be easily kind of Google Street Viewed or, you know, found. Um, and I think 90% of your answers are going to bring you, you know, probably more to the central Marin area anyway. Uh, some of the things that I was thinking, and I would certainly lean on Luke and uh, his team better for this, and we could just go out there and start writing things down. But, uh, you know, to Ann's point, I definitely wrote down like elevated bridges and platforms, um, because I think that is a feature that kids just kind of like running around on. I had wrote down sandbox, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, kind of Ian and I had communicated about in coming with this too is, helping people to understand that we're not tearing apart the entire playground and redoing the whole thing. I mean, this is really more of a project looking at replacing the play structures. Um, there might be some landscape that comes along with that, but I guess I always envision this more less as a, we're building a whole new playground as opposed to we're replacing the play structures that are within the playground area. Um, Cause there's a pretty big difference, both cost and scope wise, if you start looking at that from a, too broad of a standpoint, uh, but I'm, I'm open. Um, and then I also thought a little bit on that opening paragraph of, uh, and I, you know, and I think Anne kind of brought it home for me a little bit is, you know, a little bit less maybe about the why and more just about the what, um, you know, I'm kind of saying like these things are failing, so they got to be replaced or, uh, you know, the parts are getting beyond their expected life and just, uh, just going straight to the excitement of, you know, we have an opportunity to, uh, you know, we received significant funding to replace the, uh, the aged play structures that currently exist with, you know, new and exciting, uh, you know, dynamic interactive play structures and, you know, kind of fill it that way a little bit. Um, I, I think, I don't know, I could, I could honestly go either way. It, I, I agree with what John mentioned, whatever the intro is a couple small short paragraphs at the most, because 
the click through and completion rate of surveys is low. A lot of people will start them and uh, the percentage of people that finish them is never as high as you wish it would be. Uh, and then finally, in terms of promotion, I think the idea of like a QR code uh, or something along those lines that people can just snap right onto their phone at the playground is a great idea. I'd be interested in looking into how we can bring that to life. I don't think it can be too difficult. I don't know that we've done it. Um, we certainly have social media presence on next door. We have a Facebook uh, page that is almost entirely for our rec. Uh, and then we do have mailing lists, you know, through ActiveNet. Some of the people on ActiveNet have uh, opted out of, you know, other promotions that don't have to do with their registration, but we have a lot of email addresses that way. I mean, a large percentage of people have signed up for something, some level of activity that uh, we do registration for. So we capture all of that there too. And uh, Luke might have some other ideas on ways that we've pushed out mass communications like that too. The only thing I would just add in terms of the introductory paragraphs, I think I, hear you that it probably it may go too far in the sort of explanatory way but i did that in part based on ann's comments on earlier at earlier meetings about what she just repeated too of like people people not can you guys be quiet please uh, people not being um super necessarily excited about this and i think like just explaining to them like explaining to them too that like this is sort of like uh not a ne an almost necessary thing, um, you know, that, that, that um, at, this is not just like us doing it because we feel like it, but that there is a sort of, and, you know, end of, it is getting difficult to replace things. To me, I think that's kind of like an important educational piece of this. Um, so that was why I included it, but it, it may go a little too overboard in that direction. And it may be that there's a way to like switch the paragraphs or something like that too to kind of try to soften some of that but I, i'd be curious if, if other people think that's unnecessary for purposes of the survey then i'm i'm fine dropping it i just that was why i included it that was a good point thank you um if i can just add one thing um or i guess reiterate but uh no i think this is really clear and i like that it's simple and digestible uh, and i think uh to eric's point survey monkey does have um, a ton of options for phrasing questions and giving rankings. And there's, there's a lot of actually really cool things you can do. And once looking at the specifics on that, it might inspire certain ways to word things, but I think this is great as is. Um, and I would also avoid putting any features in list that um, you don't want on necessarily replacing the sandbox is pretty new. We just put that in like four years ago or changed days it. It to be really small um, and kind of in a bad spot. And then, uh, greatly expanded it um, just like four years ago. And so I think um, I, I, I would be, I wouldn't say we wouldn't necessarily want to think about um, replacing that per se. So I wouldn't want to give anyone fear that like, Oh no, well, they're going to get rid of the sandbox. We better vote to keep that. If, if that's not actually part of the plan at all, might be a little bit of a distraction. Um, and I also agree with, with the idea that the, the structure itself, the platforms are probably the biggest draw um, in terms of what's engaging the uh, the kids. I mean, all these different slides and and polls and ladders and things are like sort of attributes of the structure itself. And it's the structure is the is the thing that is fun and climbing the make believe the the challenge of the up and down and um and these are all components of that. But um, I'm not sure that a yeah, platform doesn't sound like a a cool feature. But I think that um it is integral in, in some way. And I, I don't know exactly what the right way to to word that, but um something about an elevated elevated uh, structure, platform, something might, might be uh, worth add, adding in there in some in some way, but it's kind of awkward to try to word that. But I, I think it's very straightforward. I think it's good. You call it elevated climbing decks. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. definitely. I was uh, thinking, yeah, elevated climbing platform or elevated climbing deck, like that. Hey Luke, can I ask you a question about the sandbox? Do you guys have any maintenance issues. When, when I was working in the city parks, there was a trend to get rid of all sand because they were too difficult. And these are likely urban problems with, you know, glass, needles, feces, whatever. But do you guys have any issues maintaining sand? We uh, have actually been really lucky with our with our sandbox. We've had um, very little of, of that. The sandbox has been a, a relatively low maintenance aspect of the playground. Um, so, you know, knock on wood, it, it, that, those things have not been concerns uh, for us at all, um, thankfully.
I just want to add uh, one comment. I like the idea of um, after looking at all the different play structures that could be available to us as I did my research, I liked this drop down list of features because as we go to select a structure, so, so, you know, if we kind of, we'll get into this in a few minutes, but, you know, select a couple of vendors that we want to do a deep dive with and look at all their products that does come up. Like what features do we want? And, and the sales rep even asked me that, like, what kind of features are your, your hallmarks or like, what are the main things you want to work with? So it would be great to get some community you know, feedback on those things, because you can have, you know, slides that cross and tube slides or twisty slides or this or that, right? So um, if there's things that seem particularly fun to kids, like individual features, I think it's easy to sort of pick those once we start working with, you know, play structures of a certain size and vendor and that kind of thing. I got to imagine too, and in terms of what we were just talking about, of uh, you know, using proper and uh, interesting descriptors, that as you're looking at these components, they probably have much better names for these than uh, platform. Uh, you know, I liked climbing deck. I like all of that. I mean, they're marketing this material, so I have to believe that they are. Uh, uh, they're they're using good buzzwords that we can kind of put in there. Yet, as long as everybody knows what the heck they mean. Uh, when we put them into what will ultimately be a static survey. I also yeah, that's like a good point. Like, just to piggyback off of what Eric said, and if you are looking for language, you could go on like Compan, C-O-M-P-A-N, go on their website and like look and see what they're calling features if you're looking for good marketing language. Mm -hmm. I also Sorry, really like, no, that's great. I also really liked the idea of uh, uh, one note in the intro talking about the timing of this project, I thought was a great idea just in terms of when we envision uh, this actually being completed and done um, is a good idea because to those points, I mean, this is still a ways out. Yeah, I, I had written in the coming years sort of along those lines, but, and I, cause I didn't know anything more concrete. What do we think, do we think two, in the next two to three years? Do we think that's the right? Oh, no, that's, I, the grant funding requires it to be more than that. I'll get you actual Oh, timing. okay, great. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't have it immediately in front of me, Ian, but I'll get you the actual timing. Okay. I mean, we have to be in a contract for this, I think by next June um, with things completed by December. We're, you know, no more than a year and a half out, I would, I would, I, I'm pretty sure, but don't quote me on that. I, I will send you the exact timing as written in the uh, funding okay. requirements. And, and Eric, I think you did the edit that at said, um, where did it go? Uh, we have secured matching grant funds. Yes. Is that right? Oh, I didn't yep. realize we, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, we've got like 177,000 in, uh, in a grant on this already. So, and then we have to provide uh 20% of the total cost, uh, which ultimately equals 25% of their of the funding provided. What grant is that, Eric? This is the Prop 68 per capita grant. Right. Eric, that's the one that, that can be used for almost anything, right? Uh, it has to be a capital replacement. It has to be uh, like recreation uh, or maybe but, park and rec. But, uh, but there's some latitude in how it can be used, right? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a, a lot, uh, just about every agency that has a, uh, a park and recreation department in Marin is, uh, I, I want to say, got on top of this and, yeah. and, is, and is getting an <clears throat> equal amount. Um, uh, through this so we were we got in we submitted the paperwork and we got approved to get and, and we're basing the budget off of the grant and the 20 percent but if we say in Ann's research there's something that pushes us up 10 20 percent are we limited in that regard or no not necessarily not necessarily we haven't uh we haven't crossed that bridge yet uh, right and then to your earlier point, um, you know, these are for capital projects, capital replacement. This is, they cannot be used for like maintenance purposes or things like that. So you can, you know, to give you an example, 
you can replace and, and install new place structures, but you can't use the funds to repair existing place structures, if that makes sense. This is for new equipment, new, and it has to be capital. It has to be uh, things like that. So, uh, and I'm happy to resend out, um, I did a staff report that kind of laid that out uh, back when we were looking at this, this funding, geez, I don't know, December-ish. Do I hear any other comments on the survey? Ian, Luke and I will follow up and uh, we'll try to tally up a, a, a list of what features are currently there. Um, and then uh, I like question three, I think leads into what other features um, that don't exist would you guys like to see? So uh, we, can, we can start putting together a little punch list on that relatively soon and easy, I think. Yeah, for sure. All right, then, Ann, you have uh, some information for us? I do. I'm going to share my screen. Some of this information came through just late this afternoon, so I don't have a, a presentation that I could send you guys, but I can share. Uh, quite a bit of information here. So, so what, um, where is the thing I wanted to show you guys there? Okay, so just to kind of orient us. So the, my sort of action item from last meeting was to do some research um, on just initial scope of a variety of different types of playground structures to give us a general idea of what might fit in our budget. And so I, I did that. I looked across uh, six or seven different companies and I called four of them. I got two calls back. So I'll take you through the results of that. Um, this spec that you're seeing right now on the screen, this is from Luke. And so this was the, this is just kind of orients us to what we're looking at. This is what we have today. We have two play structures and a swings. There's a sandbox planter and patio. And keep in mind as we go through this, that there are constraints in terms of what size of structure we can have because there have to be certain setbacks. And so, Sort of like a playable area and um, we don't need to go into details. Can, can so, I ask a question? What was that yeah. concrete patio? I don't, it's been a little while. I don't remember that. Luke, John, do you want to speak I, to that? Yeah. So the one um, in the middle next to the planter area, yeah. sorry, this is so crude. I was just, uh, yeah, this could be a lot prettier. Uh, but um, the one out there is uh, there's just a bench and uh, like a little sidewalk. Like a, it's just like a concrete um, slat, like square that's, that's uh, above the level of the, the wood chips, just sort of like a sitting area. It's not really very, um, it's not very prominent. It's just, there's like a drinking fountain over there and a, and a bench and it's just, it's just a place where we don't have the wood, we don't have the fall material or the depth. Um, so that'd be an area that would, that would be different or more difficult to put in equipment would require demolition and is not an appropriate spot to just throw new equipment. So that's why I wanted to highlight that. The, the one at the bottom of the diagram um, does not look like a concrete patio, but that is the location of the old sandbox. And it's now covered in rubber matting, um, so as to serve as as a um, fall, you know, safe fall area. But um, underneath it is uh, right underneath the the thin rubber matting is concrete. That's what the sandbox was built upon. So it does not have the same depth as the rest of the playground where the structures are. Um, and so there's different considerations that would need to be made um, if we're going to be putting something near that spot. It's just it's not um, safe fall area the, the way the other um, areas with the wood chips are. So I just wanted to highlight that uh, for as, as a relevant spot that it, it complicates things. And so just one follow-up question, when we're thinking about different structures and whatnot, are there, the concrete patio, both, both of them, I guess, are those non-negotiable? Like they're there, they're not moving. We, we can't even consider the demo of those or movement of those? Not at all. I, uh, I think that, you know, that, that would, I'm not sure what that would, what that would take to, to get 
those areas to be appropriate to put structures in. Um, I don't think they're a deal breaker at all. I just want to say that currently, um, if we didn't change those, those would be areas you want to avoid or, or at least build something a little bit farther away from them is, is all I wanted to highlight there. Do you have strong feelings about the locations of them now? No, I wish the one at the bottom didn't exist because that limited what we were able to put in. We wanted to relocate the spring toy, not spring toy, I'm sorry, the little, um, the little playhouse that was closer to the sand, the new sandbox um, over there, but, but that uh, complicated that. And, um, and I mean, it just, it's limiting. So I think, I think we definitely would benefit from expanding the, the wood chip zone and, and we could, we could take that concrete out. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have a negative impact on the, the usability of the playground at all. I don't think. Thank you. All right. Great questions. Yeah. Um, just some, some high level things. So one of the playground vendors I talked to, estimates that so as you're thinking about pricing for playgrounds that you have the price of your structure and then you add 30 to 40 percent for installation and then think five to ten percent for demo if we can do some of the demo ourselves then that you know and, that, and, and by demo i mean not concrete pads but like taking out the existing play structures so if we can do some of that work ourselves we can save ourselves some on demo, but those are some just high level things to think about in terms of budget. There's a cost of the structure, there's 30 to 40% for installation, and then there's up to 10% for demolition of the existing structure. And then after that, there's any other site work we want to do, like taking out the concrete patio, um, increasing fall height, all that kind of stuff. Um, so just, that's just some background. So let me go ahead and take you into some drawings. So Conpan, um, they're a pretty major playground provider. Uh, I contacted them and I got in touch with a local sales rep. Uh, it was a great experience. He's willing to do designs. This is one that you're looking at right now of, of what, what could work in our area. I sent him the specs and he put this together. So um, let me kind of help, help you orient. So this would be the area where the tube slides are right now where this climbing structure is where I'm moving my mouse. This is the area where the swings would be, right? This is like the planter. And then, so then he's put new swings back here, a rope climbing structure in here, and uh, like a platform climbing structure here. And this is like a carousel. Um, now, this is just one idea. Basically, he asked me, what, what kind of features are you guys interested in? And we could do just about anything. If you go on the con to playground stuff uh, but this one right here um, the items and installation that you see would be about 150,000 leaving about $50,000 for additional site work or any miscellaneous items we might want to pick up so like you could demo the two concrete pads and put something else in there's lots of little things in the playground world that you can put in that aren't full climbing structures but that are like fun playables um, or we could, you know, potentially, I don't know, look at bigger structures. This was just one idea for about 150 through Conpan. Um, this is another one from Conpan. It's similar in the sense that there's a, a rope or net climbing structure. And then there's a small, I don't like this one as much because there's a smaller sort of platform there. Again, the swings he's put over here. He suggested that actually as a safety thing, just having the swings right out in the middle, like the kids are kind of dodging the kids who are swinging a lot. So I think we could talk about that more as a group, but that was one thing he pointed out when he saw our existing playground. He's like, oh, you've got the swings right in the middle. That's generally not something we do um, from a safety standpoint. So he's moved them over here. I don't think we necessarily need to do that. This is again, just one, one person's ideas for us. This playground is also about 150,000 installed. And there's some other views of it too. Let's see if it'll load. Okay, it's taking a while. So let's go on to the next one. This is a, the third Quantan play structure uh, I have to share. Again, it just gives you an idea. There's different elements. Like this is some like funky bouldering kind of thing that they have. Um, and this is what's called a giant slide. It's actually really high. It's almost multiple stories high. So they do make these sort of giant slides. There's one down by the airport, if ever, anybody's ever been down there. Um, 
This one, the giants are more expensive. So all of this equipment installed is 200,000. So this would eat up the, all the budget. There wouldn't be anything extra um, in this one here, but it's just another concept or idea. I didn't talk with him in detail about fall height and what we would need to do to accommodate this larger structure. If it, we're interested in a giant, then I think we could have those conversations, but I thought that was premature. And this, when you say this would eat up our whole budget, do you mean everything we're looking at or just that one structure? Is that the uh, swings I mean, included? It's everything we're looking at. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, and this, and then we'll, we, I'll, I'll pause. We can take some questions and we continue on. This is just a content website. So I just wanted to show you guys how all the different, just give you a flavor. I don't know how much this one would cost, but this is another type of thing that's out there. Like this is not a very big item. So something like this might be able to be installed here or there as an accessory item. Um, it just gives you a sense that there's this kind of thing with like different ropes and obstacles um, that's becoming popular in the playground world. So as we're thinking about styles, um, you know, this, like, again, this rope stuff, like look at this one, this climbing structure is like this ropey thing. Um, seems to be hot right now. So um, there's something to think about there. I have for you other vendors to show you and other items are not as kind of polished as these, but maybe I'll pause and see if we want to have some dialogue or, and if not, then I'll just go through all the rest of them and we can talk at the end. So I'll open it up for you guys. Are there any kind of questions or comments right now? I have none. <laughs> I'll just keep going then. Okay, so then the I, next I'm, so, I'm sorry, and I can unmute fast enough. Um, just to give a little context, because the questions come up a couple times. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> total funding uh, that we are eligible for on this is uh, just under one hundred and seventy-eight thousand. Mm -hmm. The <clears> twenty percent <throat> district match requirement would be uh, right around forty-four five hundred. So you'd be looking at if we were to just max out the funding and then supply the 20% match, um, you'd be at 222,440 um, for total project cost. Um, and that is utilizing all of the funding and then bringing it up to the required amount of the match. Um, so however much of the grant funding we use, we have to uh, have a 20% match to that. The uh, <clears throat> other thing too, one of the things that we talked about as a commission and also uh, was brought to the board <clears throat> is even though like this project has to be like a single project in the same place, this is a large parcel. And one of the other factors that we looked at was the possibility of replacing the play equipment at a mini park on Las Colinas by the middle school as well. So if you're looking at some of these and they're, you know, coming in 150, 160, and that leaves you another 60 grand, uh, you know, 50 to 60 grand to replace those play structures too, um, is certainly a consideration factor. And I know Luke's gonna talk a little bit more about that play structure in his report, but uh, I think that we would be able to put all of that into a single application because it all exists on a single parcel. Yeah, that's a great point. And the number I've been using when I talk to the vendors is I've been using 200,000 and that was just, I just put a, a 10% contingency in the back of my head and because I don't know, I haven't, I have to look in detail when he said, you know, this is 150, whether that includes demo costs or not, which are about 10%. But I also just like to sort of hold back contingency when I talk to vendors. So uh, as you guys hear me talk about budget in my mind, I'm kind of thinking 200 because my sense is that maybe we'll end up doing some landscaping. It'll be something, right? So. And um, as we're but, looking at these different structures, are they, are they all like in the same category for sustainability, life expectancy, are they all built in a similar manner or is there other, like is there a Toyota or a BMW of, of playground structures? <laughs> That's an awesome question. And I, I didn't ask that. So I had not thought about that yet. And I think that's, that's brilliant. So we need to, to be aware of that as we, we move forward with quotes. You're absolutely right. And, you know, I think I would add on to that too, is this next question is which companies are going to be around for a while and easy to get parts from, because we're dealing with that now. So that's something to think about as well. Right. Um, just my Hyundai, all the dealerships closed and I can't get it serviced. And I wish I had a Toyota, you know, so. 
there's, there's something to that. So, you know, buying from a smaller company where they may not be around to provide replacement uh, items in 10 years, right? Is something yeah, to no, I, it's certainly in my own um, consumerism. I try and buy once and have it last a long time. And yeah. I feel like this is one of those things that we, we don't want to have to replace even in 10 years, right? Right. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, that's a great question. So my sense is Conpan is a pretty solid standard, right? If you just, if you go on their website and you see how massive they are, they're huge in terms of what they offer. So um, I, I would think you could ask them that what's the expected, the life expectancy, but that's definitely a question. I think that each vendor should, should answer is what's the life expectancy of their, their units. Um, and then we might want to do some independent research on that too. Okay. Anything else or should I keep kind of going through some of the other styles? Okay. Keep going. All right. So the next company that I actually had a, some dialogue with is this one. They're called Earthscape. So this is, just, is a totally different concept. This is some more sort of, you know, architectural, um, you know, dream big, um, uh, imaginative, unique kind of play structure ideas. I'm just scrolling through here so you can see some examples of the types of parks that they've done. So now I contacted them and I uh, asked them about our budget and essentially what they told me was, and I'll, I'll show you this right here. So what they told me, we just focus on the center region. Um, and cause I did kind of look at this one, this, this thing here, which is kind of neat, is sort of like a like a small village kind of concept here, is that these uh, custom architectural items are not in our budget, and so they pointed me to their uh, offshoot, which is called Dave Bang Associates. It's just a playground installer who installs their prefab items, like this uh, slide that you see on the left. So. Unfortunately, we don't have budget to kind of go really big and bold and like really reinvent the playground. Um, but we could, if we wanted something really unique, look at some of these products from Earthscape. And I'll show you a little while, bit. While more. we're looking at that, I just want to say, I love the look of that of those structures. I love the aesthetic. I, yeah. I feel like sometimes playground structures look so dated and a lot of it has to do with their materials and their color schemes. And those ones looked a little more timeless to me. Yeah. So here are more of the items that are available. Um, this is Dave Bang's website here. Um, and so these are like kind of some more of the, the kind of prefab options. These are giant slide comb. I don't know if you can see how tall this is. This little slide is like our slides. And then it goes up two more levels. So those are kind of huge piles um, and then they have what they call kinetic pieces here so you know it would also be an option I did not talk to anybody from Dave Ben yet but to reach out to them and see if they could put together some concepts for us with this kind of aesthetic or look and feel uh, would be, you know, another choice. I, at the end of this, I'll just, you know, kind of say it right now since we're in the middle of it, but I'm probably going to recommend that we select a couple of vendors, maybe two, three at the most, and engage them the way that I engaged with Conpan and try to, you know, maybe put together some ideas. Um, and we can, let's talk about that as a group. Actually, I think Eric might have and Eric and Luke might have better ideas than me on how to drive the process, but I was just kind of trying to brainstorm about how to, you know, how to, how to sort of narrow this down and what next steps we want to take. Um, I don't have any pricing quotes for these individual items from Dave Bang. That would be a go forward uh, action item would be to work with them um, on, on that. So, so and can I ask a yeah. question? So these Dave Bang ones are, these are like a kit of parts prefab versus from Earthscape, Earth, yeah. But They're Earthscape Earth is more custom. So Earthscape is the the equipment provider, and they can either do a total turnkey custom install, which they said we can't afford, or they have prefab parts, the ones that you see here, that Dave Bang can put together our playground, it would be our installer. So he would essentially buy the parts from Earthscape and install them. And I don't know if Dave Bang is an actual guy, that's just the name of the company, but that company would buy the, these Earthscape equipment parts and install them, right? So like 
basically it's a, kind of like a third party playground vendor is the way that would work. So Earthscape is providing right. the equipment and this Dave Bang Associates is the third party vendor who acquires that and installs it. So uh, yeah, more to think about there in terms of like acquiring parts in the future and all of that. I did look up on the, you know, the Dave Bang website and what other projects they've done. They, they haven't done a ton of really, like if you look at their gallery of projects of what their experience is, what they've done, they've done more like, what I'm seeing on here is just really basic elementary school playgrounds. Like I'm not seeing that they've done um, a lot of what we'd be looking for. It doesn't mean they couldn't do it, right? But they don't have those Earthscape pieces in their portfolio here. They have them on their website saying that they do sell them, but they're not like showcasing that they've done this before. So, um, but maybe if we contact them, they could tell us, yeah, oh, yes, we did recently do a new playground with those parts and we can show it to you. But this is what they're advertising that they have experience with. So it's not a no-go. I think it's just a little bit more of a, a boutique um, concept. And we just would need to work with them a little bit more and definitely worth ex you know, exploring and seeing what we come up with. Um, okay. We'll show you, this is also from Dave Bang Associates website. Uh, they source an equipment line from Berlinger. It's a German line. I contacted Berlinger directly to see if they would help, you know, send it, I have a salesperson who would work with us to do an entire playground with Berlinger stuff because some of it's kind of cool, um, but they did not get back to me. So I don't know if they do that. Maybe they just only work with third party vendors in this area. I'm not sure we'd have to, we'd have to dig into that a little bit more. Um, but they do these kind of play structures. So it's a combination of like, it's a lot of ropey stuff again. So like this Kubricon is one of their, their hallmark pieces. Um, but it has kind of a neat sort of, you know, modern look to it. Here's a giant playground they've done um, with it. I, I'm not a huge fan of this rope stuff. I try not to inject, interject too much of my personal opinion on things. Um, we played on... Um, there's a playground in San Francisco in Mission Bay. It's new. It's huge. And they have a combination of, of rope and other structures. And my kids like the rope stuff, but it is kind of hard on your hands. And so it has a, it's, it, it has like a novelty factor to it that I don't know if it's like the playground you want every day in your aftercare program, like always on it. Um, if we go with the ropey stuff, even through uh, what do you call it, a con pan. I would suggest we all go and do a little bit. Those of us with kids take our kids to a ropey playground and sort of see what they, they think of that, you know, um, and see what results we get from the survey. But, uh, but still, it's beautiful. Some of this Berlinger stuff is really attractive looking. So I included it because it was uh, a certain of a style. So one of the other vendors on the list was this company, Burke, and they do very colorful, kind of traditional playgrounds. Their website includes pricing. So you can see down here, the average list price here for this structure that you're looking at is 60,000. That's, I did the math, that's about $80,000 installed. So you could do two climbing structures, 160,000. So they're, a, you know, kind of on par um, with the con pan, maybe it's hard to do a direct comparison there because the equipment's kind of different, but this is just a different aesthetic. It's, you know, it's, um, it's bright, lots of monkey bars, um, pretty traditional looking. They also sell this product, which uh, we've played on in San Francisco and was just like endless fun. These merry-go-rounds where they have climbing ropes on them. Kids really like those. So I threw that in there and that, List price on that is around 18,000. So add, you know, 30% for install. It's not a big ticket item, but adds a little fun. So just to give you an idea, like, and there's things that could be peppered into to a playground. Um, and then this is the final, one of the final styles. This one I like because it's like that playground in San Anselmo, I think. It's like a giant, you know, fortress kind of um, that you run around in. And I, I did not, uh, reach out to big toys. I wanted to sort of see, you know, talk about next steps with the commission before I, um, 
I did that um, to kind of see what the, you know, the pricing would look like on something like this. I don't think this is actual timber. It's some other kind of manufactured um, material. I'll just put that out there because if it's wood with the rising wood prices, I, I think that'd be pretty hard to do right now. Uh, but these are kind of cute, you know, and this is a whole totally different, you know, look and flavor and concept for something that we could do. So that's what I have. And I will stop there and just, I guess, open it up for discussion. Well, I'll jump in. And I, I like that um, spinny toy, the one that you said you like for 18,000. I don't know what you call that. Yeah, that one. Like, I, that does look like it would be fun to me. And as I'm looking through all these, I'm trying to discern my own aesthetic appeal versus like the longevity that would keep kids entertained too, because they're two very different things. Because um, you sent um, some folders with different products, and I'm looking at one, the Explorer Dome by Compan. And it's a, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a rope. To, yeah. It's a rope, the rope dome. I'm actually looking at a real photograph that was in the, in that folder too. Yeah. That one. And like, that looks super cool to me. I mean, but like you pointed out, is it going to be hard on kids' hands or is it going to hold their interest? I don't, that I don't know. I, and I don't, man, I, I'm not even sure how we make those decisions. I'm hoping that in survey gets traction and, we get so many responses that it'll be easy. Um, Cause I think it's, it's hard to kind of choose from your own aesthetic to what is going to be popular with kids. Oh, the other one that you, I didn't see was the bird's nest, which, um, you know, I talked to a friend at work who's designed playgrounds and she said, those are always a hit. Um, and, you know, I don't know how much those cost. I wouldn't think that much. And I think that was that comp compound that had the bird's nest. Yeah. No, one, it's here. One of those. It's, yeah. Yeah. It says, but I, I think that Compan put them in, in their swings. So if you look, do you look, see there in the back? See it? Yeah. Right. Yep. So they, they have put one in, the, in also in their swings. Right. So that, you know, that's a great shout out. If it's, we're seeing it from multiple places, that's probably a great feature to put in. Yeah. And, and then like, th there's this, you know, we'll see how this process goes, but like something like that, like a bird's nest, like maybe people don't even know what they're called. And do, do we have to draw attention to certain things on the survey because people wouldn't know what it's called. So they'll call it different things. But then if you, if you call out a bird, Yeah, I don't know. It's hard. There's so many features. I mean, and what I've shown you guys here is is just a slice of what's available. Like, you know, if you, uh, this is a, I don't mean to keep going back to them, but I, I found their, this website to be, I mean, they're so like, okay, that's the freestanding stuff. There's so much. I mean, the variety of what you can do in here like there's even ones we didn't even look at which are like you know there's ships and castles and um, there's all kinds of different ideas um so it's hard to kind of think about like what do we what do we ask about you know um it's big so i think that's going to be one of our challenges is how do we you know how do we how do we narrow this down? Right. 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 And, if, and if we, you know, if we don't get a lot of responses from the survey, say we, let's just say we get 17 and we get three comments that say, you know, we, we want a, a rope dome, but that's the most comments we got for any one feature. Does that mean we do a rope dome because three people said they wanted a rope dome? Uh, you know, it's such a small sample size. It's not really representative necessarily of what the community wants but those are the only ones that we got. I, I'm just throwing uh, out some different thoughts. We, yeah. we could also just see what, how big of a response we yeah. get and then decide no, totally. how, how yeah. much weight we want to give it, you know, in proportion to the number of people that'll use it. Right. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I, and I guess I would just say that I think the survey, I think the survey is step one in community engagement and there will, 
necessarily and there should be, you know, additional steps down the line. And so, you know, I think it gives us, we'll see how many responses we get, but I think it'll at least give us, it'll at least serve a little bit of a public education and community engagement purpose. And it'll give us some indication of what people love about the existing play structures and what other playgrounds people are pointing to as things that they love. And then I think, you know, so I think it might be premature for us to narrow our options too much yet, but I, I um, you know, I, I'd envision however, you know, whatever point, you know, a couple months from now or whatever, where we can, at that point, we can use the survey results. Hopefully it's more than 17 try to na- try to boil things down into some you know more digestible thing and then maybe we could do either uh i don't know where covid will be at that point but if we're still doing everything remotely we could do a special zoom meeting of the park and rec commission where we invite the public to we figure out a structure to kind of you know engage people on and sort of try to go about some of these other narrowing aspects then but but i, I so anyway i think this is amazing and i and 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 a really great to get all this going now, but, um, but I do think it's probably premature for us to say like, we need a bird's nest or whatever, or even necessarily to start just including features like that in our survey. I guess I'm open to that, but. Um, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that as much as I am talking about the process of how we choose yeah. the structures. Cause I think, yeah. I mean, I think one of our, our first kind of key steps is to narrow down which vendors we want to talk to. Right. Because that's like, so just as you just think about how we're actually doing the project, how the work's getting done is you got to get a hold of the salesperson who can help you put together an idea, right. With a quote, like ultimately, and I know Eric's going to talk about how the, the pricing cost of this, but even just to get just a general idea of, what, of what's possible, you got to get somebody to work with you. And then you need someone who, and, and Luke is a playground expert. So he's a perfect person when, when, when the, the timing is right for him to jump into this, but it also helps, I think, to have an expert from the playground company, who someone who has not uh, does a flavor for design, right? Like I, you know, just as a lay person, when I first started just going through these websites and looking through everything, I thought that I was going to be able to pick a couple of play structures and like kind of, you know, I had like the original specs for how big one each one needed to be. And I'm like, I can figure this out. No, oh, it's so big. Like you need someone to kind of help direct what you're going to do. So I think we have to kind of pick what style we want, what general style, right? So you guys kind of get a flavor for like, there's like, there's that like castle that, right? Like we really feel like we want something like this versus something like that, you know, or the, the, you know, this guy parallel and then don't decide yet. But I think, choosing a couple of vendors that we want to work with intensively is might be a good step in terms of getting more operational traction. And maybe we wait for the survey results and then we do that. That could be a process too, but a lot of the vendor participation and a vendor partnership is going to drive what we can and can't do. Yeah. I, I think that makes sense. And, and I think, um, I, I guess I'm still kind of stuck on the process. Whereas Maybe maybe we reach out to other stakeholders. And Luke, um, you have, you know, you have camp counselors coming in every summer that just observe kids on the structures. Can we survey them and kind of get some input from them? Would would that be a good source of data to kind of see what the kids gravitate towards? Um, yeah, John, I think that's a great point, and that that was something that I was thinking of um, as we've been talking is that uh, um, there's a whole other component of this. I mean, one is the, the public coming out and using the playground, which is, which is kind of the, the probably the most important aspect of this. But um, the other is that we've got a large number of programs and activities that we run that utilize the playground. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we do have a lot of staff that observe kids regularly, you know, daily, the preschool program, the after school program and our, and our summer camps are seeing uh, how 
kids in the community utilize the the play structure what areas um you know they have the most fun on that they that they which which areas they ignore which areas they're like flocking to on a daily basis and i think that's gonna be that's gonna be valuable feedback um we will have a lot of those people we have some of them around right now and a lot of them are going to be working this summer with our existing playground so with this lens you know we could definitely gather a little bit more data about that and um and which might help the conversation um but i think that's a that's a valid point and what just one thing that i and this is a great presentation and thank you so much for bringing all the visuals to this and it's definitely you know some of these, these pictures is like oh man that would be amazing to have that that'd be amazing right. to have this and i think that the um, I, my, my, I'm a little bit of a, a nervous, like, ah, oh, that seems like that's way outside the realm of, 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 the, of the budget. That seems way outside. It just seems like these would be major overhauls as opposed to um, a simple structure replacement. So I think maybe we'd have to, I mean, if this opened up to the public with this, this big of a, a realm of, of all these different possibilities, um, I'll be afraid that they're going to get pretty disappointed when we figure out what we can actually pay for and put in might be just, you know, a little bit more simple than, than some of these really neat things. And maybe this is something that's down the line as a, a giant playground remodel as opposed to a, um, a, st a structure replacement in the meantime. And I don't know if that's something that we need to, you know, suss out, but um, it yeah. sounds amazing. I think, Luke, you could, we could work more with, so the, you, I think the, the guy from Contan actually, he, he knew you, he knew your name. Um, Mark Wills is his name. Anyway, yeah, um, he, he, you know, it was really great of him to put these together, but he asked me up front, he's like, well, what kind of, what do you guys want? And I said, you know, we're really like skies open right now. So if you want to just throw something together, I'd love to see it is what I told him. But we could also go back to him and say, hey, we want to see, you know, two structures like this, which is kind of similar to what we have now in a sense, right? It's platforms, it's slides, it's things to climb on um, and come back with pricing. We might be, you know, that would be a, a simple approach to do too. That would be more the, you know, just to replace the existing structures is just to have them. He knows his products. He could probably just take the size of the, existing areas and tell us which items they have that would fit. I think that'd be an interesting explore rather, even if we decide to go bigger than that. I mean, that's really a question worth asking. It might be interesting. You might come back and tell us that. And then we realize then we have extra budget for improved landscaping and redo the mini park and maybe some other things that could be pretty cool. Take out those concrete patios and do something better there or something like that, you know? Yeah, definitely. Luke, if, if we were to tap into the camp counselors to, to get more data on uh, with observations, uh, about how many people, camp counselors, would that would we be like interviewing? And would it make sense to use the survey that Ian created for them? Or would that be a different survey, a different process because they're observing kids all day long in the structure? Um, that's a good question. I mean, it, it could be either or, or both. I, I think it'd be interesting to, to ask them questions specific to what, um, what, instead of like what they like for their own, you know, kids or something, and just seeing what they sort of more objectively have witnessed the usage of our playground from a less invested um, perspective, where, or I guess less subjective, where they just thought, here's what the kids in camps tend to, to like, and this is what they like about it, and this is what we see the most um, imaginative play versus this, you know, and, and that'd be maybe a custom uh, set of questions to, to ask because that's a little different than what we would ask the general public. But um, I think their input on both things would, would potentially be valuable. And I think it would be, we wouldn't to give this to the entire staff and they would handpick people who we know have been in positions where they're, um, you know, being, ex you know, especially observant during those times and have been in leadership roles of the camps during, during playground time, um, not necessarily to the whole camp counselor staff because that would probably be unproductive. But. Right. Thank you. Hey, Luke, I was just thinking about your, your previous comment about just wondering about the pricing of some of these things. I mentioned to you that this, the one that you're looking at here is a turnkey installation. So everything should be included in the pricing estimates when we get to that more granular. This is not a granular estimate by any means. This is a ballpark idea, but they, you know, I would imagine he would come out to the site, they would do a full estimate 
that's something that might be nice to do, whether we go with the Dave and Bang or Earth Elements or something like this, but to find a firm that does that turnkey so that we have the whole the pricing idea up front for when we know what we're looking at, you know, also versus like, I look at this and I, Oh, wouldn't it be fun to put that spinning carousel with the ropes in here, but involving multiple companies makes it a lot more complicated. It might be better just to go with one vendor um, to do the project. So we have better, a clearer, a clearer idea of price. Can I chime in on just some random thoughts that I've been writing down? Uh, so I'm going to try not to be too scattered with this uh, and I'm going to segue off of what Ann just said. One of the things that I uh, need to wrap my head around is the legal process with the kind of procurement and vendor selection um, and the process that we have to go through as a public agency when it comes to this. I, you know, it's just, uh, it's a little bit trickier because this isn't, you know, your typical construction, you know, build based off of a specific design that's already been incorporated. Um, so I need to get that info and I'll try to get that within the next couple meetings, just in terms of here's the actual process we're going to have to follow um, from a, a, you know, a legal, you know, procurement standpoint. Um, and we can hit up some of the other local agencies who've done some of these things uh, at these cost points and just said, you know, what were the legal steps you had to go through just in terms of RFPs or vendor uh, selections or anything. So I think that will obviously kind of play a part into here. Um, the other thing I was thinking as we were going through this, uh, and I will follow up on, uh, you know, what is our ability to actually have a meeting at the playground? Uh, right now, I don't know that we have an ability to do that because there's still kind of the govern, governor's uh, order that's uh, prohibiting public meetings from, you know, bringing in members of the public. Um, so I'll have to kind of get my head around that. Uh, some of the other thoughts that I had, I thought a, uh, a question potentially for the survey that could be kind of telling um, is how often do you visit? and use the Marinwood playground um, because that kind of led me into listening to some of Ann's thoughts of, yeah, this was a fun thing for them to go to one time, but I don't know that this is their everyday playground just because of the materials, which brought me to, you know, who is the kind of intended or uh, target audience on this? Is it our frequent users? Is it the people that come and use the playground once every couple months that are coming from farther out? Uh, me personally, I would tend to look towards some of those frequent users. And I do think actually to, you know, Luke's um, point earlier, I do think that does include our preschool, our aftercare and our summer camps, as well as, you know, a lot of the uh, families that live more in the immediate neighborhood. I know when I am coming and going from here, I tend to see the same cars in the play in the parking lot three or four days a week that are bringing, you know, the same families that are going exclusively to go sit over and let their kids play in the playground. So I think that's kind of an interesting question that might show varying response. Uh, the other thing that I was thinking too is just the aesthetic of everything and blending into the environment where the playground is going. And I'm wondering if it would be helpful as we're talking to some of these vendors, not only to show them that um, kind of diagram layout, but an actual picture from a little farther back of this is the physical environmental setting that this goes into showing, you know, these giant oak trees that are coming, uh, the wooded Creek bank on the back side of it, I think will help guide some of their thoughts into what some of these types of structures should be. Because while I agree, a lot of these structures are great. Some of the big bright colors, I think when you get them into this, you know, kind of a real natural setting of what our primary playground is, are gonna look really out of place, in my opinion, really fast. Um, and that could be just simply a color palette uh, change that helps guide that instead of these bright pinks and yellows and everything, which are good for, you know, in the middle of an open field kind of a park. In my mind, I like the earth tones, I like the greens, I like the neutral colors that I think blend into, you know, the wood tones that blend into that area better. Um, these are just some thoughts that were coming my way. I think we could probably get some pictures done that would help uh, frame where specifically these are going to complement that diagram that Luke created. 
which uh, I know he was making fun of himself, but I actually thought it was really good because it had those measurements. And that's the most important part of that. Here's the basic layout and here's the measurements we have to play with. Uh, I thought that that was really good. Um, so those were just kind of some of my thoughts, um, you know, with me being in my position, the primary thought of what is the legal process we're going to need, you know, once we whittle this down to here's the type of playground, the type of structures, the, the basic color palette, um, what's the legal process towards actually procuring, uh, you know, and selecting a vendor to come in and do this work um, is going to have a big part in this too. Because uh, unfortunately, we're a public agency, and you know, fortunately and unfortunately, um, and sometimes process uh, the required process is going to dictate the direction we have to go with this. Eric, can I ask you uh, just a timeline question? So I, I think I remember that by the end of this year, we have to have a like a, a proposal to get the grant money. Um, and so, what like roughly what's in that proposal? The reason why I'm asking, let me tell you, because I think it'll help, is I'm trying to figure out uh, at what speed the design process needs to move in order for us to be on track, right? Like, do we have to kind of have some pretty good designs buttoned up by the end of December, or is that by next June when we select a vendor? Right. So to give you a sense, um, a very high level bullet point in December, 2021, that is the deadline to submit the project application. The project application does not need to be as detailed um, typically as, you know, with this type of a play equipment, you know, it's something much more high level of, you know, we are proposing to replace all of our play structures um, uh, in our existing playgrounds, you know, with new structures, removing the old structures, uh, things like that. I don't think it needs to be much more detailed than that. Uh, June 2022 is when we have to have uh, execute a contract for the approved projects. Um, and I'm assuming that to mean, and I'll have to revisit, I haven't looked at this, but I'm assuming that to mean, you know, with an actual builder. Um, and then December of 2023 is when the project has to be completed. Um, and then March 2024 is when we have to submit all of the completion packages and everything. So I think, if, um, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, so if we were going the RFP route, when would we have, when would we do that? Because that would be kind of our design deadline, right? I realize we may not go the RFP route, but just using that as a benchmark to give us an idea of what our deadline is for design. Typically, um, depending on what all is involved in terms of qualifications of bidders, um, you would want to keep it out there for a minimum of 30 days. Uh, just to allow enough time for it to circulate, uh, garner response, um, take in requests for information, answer those, uh, and kind of start your interested bidders list. Um, and then after those 30 days, you would actually kind of open the bids. I am not 100% sure if this is going to need to be like a sealed bid process, like a typical public works construction type. Uh, these are things I need to wrap my head around a little bit more because this is kind of a very specialized uh in essence we're buying part we're not building um you know and so installation but there is requirements when it comes to procuring goods over certain amounts um so i will i will get much more educated on that uh, in the coming uh month or two um then uh from there ultimately the expenditure would come down to an approval of the board so we would want to kind of time it out with a uh not only a preceding commission meeting to kind of be able to look at that, but then the immediately following the board meeting to present uh, to the board for formal approval to execute a contract per se. So if by June of 2022 is when we need to have that done, then I would say, you know, you'd probably want to be looking at bid opening around, uh, you know, mid-May uh, of accepting in these things of 2022. So a year from now, uh, gives it time for everything to be vetted and looked through and qualified in terms of any qualification requirements of bidders um, so that it can be approved in June of 2022 and a contract can be uh, signed immediately after that. Um, we might want to bump that up just in case we don't like what we're looking at and need to go back through another round, uh, at which case I would be looking at more, you know, kind of like a February timing for round one and hope that works. Um, if that makes sense. So it could be eight months to 
11 months from today. Yeah, that's great. That's what I, I was thinking. February, March was a design deadline as you were just talking through right. everything, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you never want to pull it to the last minute because A, you never know how the this is going to come out. And I think once I can get some clarity on what the, uh, the kind of selection and the legal process is, is how we can move forward with this, that then we can backwards engineer a schedule pretty easily from there. Anyway, those were my kind of thoughts as I was listening to everything here. Uh, yeah. Just compiling little, you know, bullet point notes. Um, yeah. In, in no in no particular order. I, I would like yeah. to echo one thing that you said, Eric, in the design aesthetic. I I see these more modern structures, like the one we're looking at, more suitable in an urban setting even. And I, I tend to gravitate towards the more earth tones and something that fits into the aesthetic of our site. I mean, we have like magnificent oak trees, bay trees that kind of frame that site and I think there's, it, in, this is just my opinion, that the contrast of a structure like this is a little much for me. Yeah, I, I, I personally fully agree with you. I think it's such a beautiful, unique setting, um, you know, under the trees, along the stream, you know, the creek bank there, uh, that the complementing that needs to uh, be, in my opinion, a, a high priority of the overall uh, design of what we're trying to do. I think that's a great idea to include some pictures and see what, you know, which changing color palettes or different product line or different vendors just to, to look at it through that lens is going to be really important. We can, it may be pretty easy to do. You can almost just kind of put a copy paste this into something, right? Just cut it out and stick it into a, like a PowerPoint, just drop it right on top of you could do a homemade thing just to get an idea. Does um, anybody have a drone and a GoPro we can use? <laughs> you just take a picture of it and just drop it in. <laughs> I think some slightly elevated pictures would make a big difference, personally. It's my hack. Um, one thing I will mention, I don't know, you know, one thought I had as I was looking at um, these guys, you know, the towers look fun. I asked my kids, what do you think of these towers? And they're like, well, they look really fun, but what else do you do besides go up and go down the slide? So just something to think about with these really, uh, these kind of appealing sort of earthy elements. Um, and of course, if I'm helping to get quotes, I'll drive this in whatever direction everybody else wants to go, but I'm just adding in my, my two cents is that there's not that much to play on here. Like you play what on this little thing, but then the rest of this is like, what is that? Like you can't do anything with it. it no, just sits I, there. I totally agree. It's it's got to be functional, for, form and function, right? Like the bird's yeah. nest to me is something that that type of that one we're looking at with the swings and the bird nest. Like maybe that's both, right? And I, I'm yeah. not the best judge, but I like the look. I think the kids would like it. Yeah, I think so. The other thought I had too is these ideas like log piles. There um, was a Waldorf school that we used to live near when I lived in San Francisco and they had a playground, a log pile playground like this. And so fun because we lived in an urban environment. So to find a pile of logs was like, oh my God. But you know, keep in mind that here in Marinwood, the rest of the community center property, we have a forest like and a creek where there are log piles. So I don't know that we need to put those in the playground. Like, well, I think what they need in the playground is agility equipment that challenges their bodies versus something that looks more, I mean, we have all the rest of that land and open space for them to play with these other earth type elements. So okay. it's just it's my really two cents. Yeah, really that we, we really need that sports equipment in there for them because that's what they, they don't have that, those options any other, any other places, you know? All right. That's a lot. We've to, and I agree with Luke. Thank you. You've done a tremendous amount of work on just kind of bringing some visuals and uh, starting to put this to life a little bit. So thank you. Uh, I think we have a good direction to work off of. Like I said, I'm, I'm certainly going to, uh, you know, just tasks at hand. Um, I, I will make sure that we get clear on kind of the legal process towards actually getting this thing done. Um, 
uh, Luke and I can work on getting Ian um, some more, uh, you know, concise and specific list of what the current existing features are that are within the playground um, and go from there. Uh, and then we can help uh, get this survey finalized. Um, I do agree with, you know, sometimes less is more and, you know, keeping it simple and uh, some open-ended and a couple of ranking uh, type uh, quantitative questions are good. Um, and we can get this out on our account and get it launched, uh, taking into account some of the things there. Um, and maybe uh, the three of us, Ian, we can find a time just to kind of get together, uh, you know, spend half hour, an hour together and uh, finalize, make sure we're liking what we've got listed. And then um, we can always push out a, uh, a beta just to the commissioners to take a quick look at um, and shoot feedback back to staff and say, Yep, that looks great. Or let's talk about this one more time as a commission before we push it out to the public. Uh, but I, I don't know that we need that. I think feedback on the survey was already pretty solid and I don't envision changing a lot on that. And then uh, I, the other thing I didn't mention too was I thought it, a really good question was, you know, kind of what is the expected equipment life expectancy of some of these things that we're looking at too. I mean, are we building a, a five, 10 year playground or are we looking to build another 20 year playground? I don't know. Um, but I think that's important consideration. Thank you. Um, and then otherwise on tasks at hand and we'll uh, work on trying to get some pictures done too that, uh, you know, properly kind of frame it up. So that way, as we do talk to people, they know what the setting is. Cause I, I do agree. I think the setting of where these things go is just as important as what goes in there as well. So. Eric too, I can take an action item just to go back. And since I'm just familiar with these, some of these, just go back and look through the vendors again with the, sure. if you send me the picture, I could just okay. go back and just look at these in a rough way. And then if I find anything that I think really looks, you know, I can share something at the next meeting if I just try to get some aesthetic ideas about what would look good with the environment. Great. Thank you. I mentioned to you too, there was one vendor I noticed had a playground line that was vandalism resistant. I was thinking about the mini park because that mini park gets hit all the time by the middle schoolers tearing it up. So Do, anyway. does it have little sensors that spray paint back <laughs> at the kids? <laughs> It's got a, it's got a little automated collar. Calls the sheriff. And yeah. Puts a exactly. spray paint on him. <laughs> no. Uh, okay. No. 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 Um, okay. Am I missing anything on upcoming tasks for the immediate future? Okay. I'll uh, I'll get cranking on some of that, and I'll get some info put together and. Uh, put together a, a staff report for the next uh, time this is discussed as the commission and that I think will help. Um, okay. Uh, one comment I'd like to add for possibly on the survey would be to allow people to submit photos of apparatuses or, or, or structures that they like as opposed to also trying to list them off the off the list to give them, you know, if they have that opportunity to submit a photo. Another thing I was thinking of is, it, I'm sorry to see the cost of these things are up so high because I think it would be nice if we could incorporate uh, that poured in place uh, rubber surface in some of our areas, especially in the tot areas. I know that is probably still, I know when I was involved with that, it was quite expensive, much more than the engineered wood fiber but it is uh, you know, a, a ideal for ADA accessibility and it, you know, long lasting. And so if there's an opportunity to incorporate things like that or a, a new surface like that, I, I think that would be to our advantage. You know, Eric, just a thought, I don't know, uh, and or Luke, do we wanna send the, it was that like list of the, uh, vendors that I was working from. It was about 10 vendors. I don't know if the other commissioners want to receive that, that list, you know, it's uh, if, if other people want to look from an aesthetic standpoint too, 
and just kind of get ideas. It doesn't necessarily, I don't mean to just be like jumping in and the lead on this. I may not be able to stay in the lead on it either. I'm just, just trying to be helpful. But if other folks want that list of vendors to start um, looking at aesthetics, I think that'd be great too. We should probably make sure we're organized about who's contacting the sales reps, just because it might confuse them if there was uh, more than one of us reaching out. But if other folks want to just look and get ideas too, um, I don't know if it would be okay for you or Luke to just send that list of vendors to the commissioner so that they have it. Yeah, I think that's, that should be fine. Right, Eric? Yeah, yeah, we can certainly send it out. Just uh, you don't, you can't sit there and talk amongst it. The uh, outside of the meeting setting. Um, the other thing too, to, you know, amongst these vendors is uh, especially with these funds that have come out through the state and through this Prop 68, um, you know, there's a lot of vendors to the, you know, and they just write it into the total cost, but they're like, you know, any place structure over, you know, expenditure over X amount includes free installation and things like that too. So there's, you know, ways to kind of take advantage of certain things. Um, we might not like those vendors and it might not be worth going that way, but there's certainly a lot of, I think, uh, these vendors, especially in California, have realized that a lot of money has been poured into this general area and are trying to get uh, competitively creative in how they can uh, uh, be the most, uh, you know, cost competitive in, in these things too. So, I mean, there's so many vendors and I know the ones that Luke put together, I would defer to that um, strictly because his knowledge of the vendors and the quality of and things of what they do is, is far superior to mine. So I would completely defer to Luke. I just know that ever since I became the primary contact on this grant, which is a, you know, state funded grant, uh, all of a sudden my, uh, my emails have upticked greatly uh, from cold call. I've gotten on all sorts of playground and other vendor lists uh, almost within weeks of me submitting that paperwork. So they're yeah. obviously out there requesting contacts for everybody who's uh, submitted the initial filing for this uh, funding. Yeah, Eric, to your point, I did have a thought, you know, I, I, I really just talked with the Conpan sales rep and then briefly with Earth, you know, Earthscape with email. But I think we need you or Luke involved when we're talking costs at all with any of these vendors. So just it's a thought in terms of process. Like, I, I just feel like, I'm under equipped in terms of the amount of knowledge that I have about playgrounds and constructions. I just, I think it might be in our best interest to make sure we've got someone who really understands how these costs work and how these negotiations go uh, in these dialogues, right? Um, so th just, just putting that out there as we think about the process go forward before we get deeper into vendor talks. You know, my initial talks were just really high level and I let the guy know up front that um, I was just making an initial call and there would be someone else that would come in and take over as lead on the project um, and that would have more input. But I'm hesitant to make the sales rep work too hard or do too much from a cost perspective or too many estimates um, really, you know, until we've got the right people in the conversation with them, if that makes sense. I think it makes a ton of sense. And I think it makes sales rep worth a grain would be happy to start setting up Zoom calls and walk through their own little presentations and doing all of that too. And I think as we get uh, a little bit farther down, we'll be ready mm -hmm. to really start doing that too. And when I say a little bit, I'm not, I think that that's sooner than later. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I would uh, defer to, you know, Luke as our rec director on a lot of that, but I'd be happy to sit in on things too and can uh, chime in on some of the administrative aspects too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I guarantee you, these guys also know about the procurement process and everything because 90% of their customers are public agencies, albeit schools or, uh, uh, you know, local government and things like that. So, uh, you know, private parties don't build a lot of parks and put in a lot of playgrounds. So. All right. All right, anything else from commissioners? If not, then I'll uh, ask for pu public comment. Yeah, and I'm gonna ask you if you could stop sharing your screen if you don't mind.
I mean, I guess I could take it off, but yeah, there you go. All right, sure. One second, John. Okay. Stephen, we'll, we'll need to wrap this up. Your comment.
Okay, thank you, Stephen. Okay, uh, we'll move on to item number six. This is the uh, Recreation and Park Maintenance Activity Report. Mr. Fretwell. Thank you, John. Thanks, everyone. Um, <clears throat> So I'll just touch on a few things here. Um, camp, uh, summer camp starts in about three weeks and um, it's been a long month of uh, camp enrollment issues and us, uh, not issues, but um, our endeavor to uh, increase enrollment and then take everybody off the waiting list has been a day in day out uh, all day event um, for the office staff. And I'm grateful for them putting all the hard work into to getting emails out and taking phone calls and working with all the families to get everybody enrolled and we've filled up um, most of the spots. We've gone through the entire waiting list for the summer camps and uh, we've got a handful of spots remaining in some of the camps, but those are continuing to fill up. So um, I'm expecting things to be um, pretty much full for summer. Uh, we added more than 500 and filled more, more than 500, oh, just under 500 spots in the last, um, the last four weeks. And so I'm uh, grateful to the rec staff for all their hard work to, to make that happen. And we're very happy to be able to serve that many more families this summer than what we originally were intending. So that's going to be um, a really great thing. The pool uh, season has been going really well. We just started uh, allowing, or we have had our first weekend of recreation swim reservations on the 15th and 16th of this month, as well as our first weekend of private swim lessons. And um, everything's been filling up and those all went very smoothly. Right now we're taking like 10 groups uh, to, that can reserve the pool for recreation swim um, for two different time slots on the weekend days. And um, those, have, those have been selling out now. And depending on what happens in uh, with with them lifting a lot of the health guidelines and restrictions on June 15th, um, we'll be looking at how we can adapt and allow uh, more usage of the pool. Um, with that, we, we aren't sure exactly what uh, guidelines will stay in place at the county level, if any, and, and how that'll affect our ability to operate the pool. Um, I've been in discussions with the uh, health department with the other agencies in Marin, we've been on some Zoom calls just strategizing and asking questions and figuring out what, we, what we're able to do. And um, the pool has been coming up a lot because there've been a lot of health restrictions about how many people can be in the pool and how you can operate the pool. And um, it's not clear whether all of that goes back to normal on June 15th or whether um, there'll still be some uh, restrictions and, and limitations and guidelines in place. So we're playing it by ear right now. And um, as soon as we know for sure what that's going to look like later this summer, we'll, we'll adapt as, as we're able and what makes sense um, for the community and for staffing and all of that. So um, that's going well in the meantime, uh, swim lessons have been filled full. We're, we're trying to open up more spots for people and uh, working on that. Um, and lab swim reservations continue to be um, extremely popular and, and full each each day and each time so uh, that's all going well i hope we can just open things up more and more as the summer uh, moves on um and then the staff has been uh, just busy getting everything ready for summer um training staff uh, ordering supplies getting all of our um, schedules out and plans so things are on track and going smoothly and, and we're looking forward to, to putting on another great um, summer program so that's all on track um on the parks maintenance side um we did, uh, I'll, I'll touch on the mini park because we, as we've been talking about playgrounds, um, unfortunately this last week we did experience some more vandalism at the park um, and that consisted of two of our uh, elevated platforms being broken, um, most likely jumped on um, by one or more uh, individuals until the the supports gave way and then we've got um, sort of the, they went from this to this uh, broken in the middle and, and compromised. And so the two elevated platforms at the mini park are no longer safe. Um, we have them, staff got out there pretty quickly to, to board those up and, and secure them. So no one climbs on that, or hopefully no one climbs on that. And uh, we've are in the works of getting replacement platforms uh, delivered. So um, those have already been ordered and, and we're, um, hoping to get those soon. I don't have a date yet, but we're hoping that the playground isn't out of commission too long. Uh, but we're, it was just unfortunate to, to see a repeat of that after about, I don't know, it's been, it's been um, a few years since we've had to deal with something like that. 
uh, the staff are continuing to uh, work on getting the turf fortified for all the summer traffic um, and uh, getting things uh, aerated, seeded, uh, soiled, and, and blocked off in irrigation, getting uh, checked and repaired. Had a few leaks that, that we fixed um, and things are looking like they're on track to be in good shape for the summer. And then as they have time, the staff continue to work on uh, the landscaping project at the Fireman's Hill. It's been slow uh, with some of the leaks and repairs we've had to make recently, but um, they're, they're kind of back working on that. And uh, we hope to have um, some more progress in the near future. Um, and that's, I guess all I'll point out. Um, please let me know if you guys have any, any questions about uh, that or anything else going on with Parks and Rec. Yes, I know it's late, so I'll be really quick, but the, did you say, are we still, are you still anticipating we're going to be operating under COVID restrictions after June 15th? That's, I guess it's a little confusing to me because we keep kind of hearing that everything's supposed to be reopening and there aren't any more restrictions. So I'm just wondering what communication you're getting from public health. I know it's sort of like this layered trickle down thing, um, you know? Yeah, that's a great question, Ann. And, and so the, we've had a couple, a couple mixed signals about that. The, um, the main kind of talking points that we keep getting is that uh, everything is going to be opened up, no restrictions, um, except for um, what they call like mega events, you know, like 5,000, 10,000 plus people events are going to have certain restrictions. Everything else is going to be unrestricted. But then um, there's certain things that say that we're going to refer to um, CDC guidance on, on masks and, and certain types of programs. And there's Cal OSHA uh, uh, the requirements that'll be in place for certain other types of things and, and for operating in the workplace. And so there's just, it, it's everyone's hoping that it's going to be uh, business as usual. And that's what they, we keep hearing. Um, but then um, as I've been on meetings and talking with other agencies, there's a sense that there will still be certain restrictions that apply to kids indoors or to um, the pools may have certain restrictions um, in some way. And hopefully not, but we're just, we're waiting to see and, and we're trying to be um, cautious and what we plan for so that we don't end up um, planning for a, a large reopen and then finding out we have to scale a couple things back after the fact. So uh, we're cautiously optimistic, but um, we, we haven't been given a super clear indication of um, on the 15th, if that's just like, you're, everything's great, everything's back to, to pre-COVID, or if um, there still are a few things we're gonna have to work within. So I, I can't say for sure what all that means and, and we may be being extra cautious for no reason, but um, that's just the this, this sentiment kind of going throughout the county is that um, there may still be some restrictions in place on some for some specific types of programming and, and facility usage. Okay, but you don't have to like dialogue with public health on like a set of procedures or do you not even know that yet, right? Because I know most businesses and facilities are open with a set of procedures that they worked out with public health, right? So does that go away after June fifteenth, or do we just just not know until wait and see what happens? We um, we th we're hoping that that just means that uh, all of that just gets canceled and that things are back to pre-COVID, just you know following the normal the normal health guidance we would normally be following. Um, but uh, there there also are um, in this last meeting there was an indication that some of the guidelines may be changed from guidelines to recommendations, um, which actually makes things a little bit more ambiguous and, and isn't clear. So there, they could the restrictions officially um, might go away, but there may be still uh, some pressure. Uh, put on us in some form or another to continue taking certain precautions and, and that just hasn't been spelled out and I don't think even the county knows um, what their role is going to be in guiding the agencies in Marin uh, after um, after June 15th and I think that that's still unknown and, and if they're going to feel pressure to continue to provide some level of guidance and, and restrictions on things or whether it really will be um, a return to business as usual I, and I just think there's, there's too many unknowns and and I've heard enough hinting that there might still be some, some things in place that um, we're just being cautious and, and waiting to hear. If, if, can I just add to that too, in terms of the dialogue with public health, the meetings that Luke's talking about, not only are with all the other providers, but there's often um, key representatives from public health involved in those meetings too. So this is coming kind of straight from them of, uh, we just don't know yet. So, I mean, that's kind of here is a, uh, I mean, it's going to really come down to the wire. And I think they're taking a very smart approach of rather than anticipating mass opening, anticipating a, a degree of opening that then we won't have to scale back. 
and kind of go from there. So we just, you know, in terms of mask wearing and, and I got to point out from my seat, I mean, you know, to Luke's point, you know, OSHA is still to weigh in on this too. And what all this means in a workplace environment for all of our counselors and, uh, and other staff too. So, you know, we might uh, have a, one view of this on for the kids, but a different view for employees. And I, my last I heard is that we're expecting some more concrete direction from OSHA um, right around June 1st or the beginning of June. Keep my fingers crossed for music in the park in summer 2022. Right. <laughs> music, yeah. And hopefully something before then, uh, some some form of events. So. Any other comments from commissioners? Then I will open it up to a public comment. There's. No hands raised on this one, John. No oh, hands raised, hold, all right. Oh, not, hold on, hold on. All right, sorry, go ahead. Please don't. Give you another minute, Stephen. Oh. All right, then we'll conclude public comment. No, he's, he's muted. All right, hold on. Okay. Okay. All right, next item number seven is uh, commissioner items of interest. Anything? Well, I'll just jump in on the topic that's seemingly elusive to get on the agenda is the horn trail. We've talked about it several times, but it never appears. Hey, John, uh, if, uh, if I could just jump in, would you um mind reiterating um specifically what you would like to see from me on that topic because i'd be happy to to touch on that i'm sorry that that hasn't ended up on my report um this month but uh um well i happy to... i wasn't i i guess i'm not sure if it was going to be an agenda item or in the report but i think mostly what i'm looking for is just what it what how does our staff view that trail what does the maintenance look like um, you know, I'll give you one example. There was a bay tree that, a large bay tree that fell several years back. I actually called it in because it was blocking the trail. I would have loved to have seen it notched and then the trail just, you know, hikers could continue through. 
but instead it was bucked up into you know a hundred small pieces and left there and that's not really the the aesthetic that I, I think we should be maintaining that trail with um, but I, anything else that you could add to it would be great and interesting and I completely recognize that we're a small staff and that's not really the highest priority and, and I can appreciate that but I guess I just you know like to have the discussion just the same. No that's helpful thanks John I can uh, work that in. I guess another thick piece of that whole discussion on horn would be to just like the discussion of bike usage and whatever rules we have precluding that and how that's being how that's going uh, I guess with the um, increased overall bike usage that I guess I would say I've perceived during COVID and um, with the Pawnee Trails construction. Okay. Anything else? You know, I have an update. It's not so much an agenda item, but I, I don't know where else to put it. So I'll just say it. I, I have been trying to communicate with um, the fire chief, Darren White, regarding a site visit um, for some of the spaces that they're looking at projects in, in the Marinwood jurisdiction. Uh, we've been yet to able to set up a site visit, but I'm, I'm still hopeful that I will get the opportunity to look at the sites. And when I do, I'll report back to this um, commission. Great. All right, is there anything else? Motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? John, John, you have a, a comment on this topic. A comment on the uh, items of interest? Yeah, well, request for future agenda items. Okay. One, one second. Yep. Yes. Okay, now we'll go back to the uh, adjournment if there's nothing else. Uh, before everybody leaves, just an announcement. I, I will not be at the next meeting. Uh, I'm going to be completely out of the area on a family vacation with extended family. Um, so please, uh, if you could, let me know if uh, everybody else will be around and able to go. And if there is a meeting, I'm going to lean on Luke to... Uh, uh, put the stuff together and get it out there because I'll be actually gone most of the week before the meeting and through the actual meeting date. So uh, keep an eye out, uh, most likely from Luke for a final agenda um, and most likely need a new uh, 
link to use because this one goes through my account. Um, so I got to figure out how I'm going to get Luke in on that um, just because of the way our accounts work and the settings. He does have an account, but it's slightly different than the account I have. So um, I guess my point being, I won't be at the meeting. And if you can't attend the meeting scheduled for June 22nd, please let me know so we know if uh, we will even have a quorum to have that meeting anyway. I know it's school will be out, so people may be out and about that first week or two. Motion right. to adjourn. I recall your motion to adjourn. And I'm looking for a second. We got one from Ian. All in favor, say good night. Vaccinated. Thanks, everybody. Uh, good meeting. Thank good you. Night. Thanks, everyone. Good night.